if you could just uh, press record for us, I'd appreciate that. Recording in progress. Greetings one and all. Thank you for investing your time. I know um, 45 minutes in an executive's time is uh, quite a lot. Thank you for investing your focus, your attention. Thank you for investing your mindfulness to be here in this, in this moment. And thank you for your sense of inquiry. I really appreciate that. As we've heard, neuroscience is the young kid on the block. In actual fact, not really that young. It's come way back from the 18th century. But in the year uh, 1967, somewhere around there, it began to take uh, momentum. And from there, it has been interrupting the world of psychosocio analysis um, and has been showing up a whole lot of things in terms of that. We're going to take our time today so that we could have time for question and answers. And uh, I value each and every one of you and the position that you fill in your particular organization. So we're going to be paying attention to the normal customer retention engagement management system. Um, which has somehow been designed by whomever and we're going to compare it with neuroscience connection and orchestration index. Um, this is an index that my uh, team, I am mentored by two neuroscientists, two neurosurgeons and I'm also mentored by people in the Institute of Neuroscience in the United States and the McLean Institute of International Coaching connected to the Harvard Medical School. So if you look at this particular flip chart, top right hand corner is where our customers are. And my first question to you would be is, what would, what would happen if you had to lose after the session, 30% of your customers. And I'd like you just to quickly type in, in the chat box, what would you lose? What would be the two or three things that would, that would be impacted on, that would disappear, uh, besides giving you a high level of stress and possibly even a heart attack? Um, but what would be the result of losing 30% of your customers in the next 40 minutes. Think about it and just please be so kind as to type into the chat box. And um, Tony, if you could just read off as they're typing, please, so I can just get to hear <clears throat> where people's thinking are. So well done folks, 10 out of 10 for understanding what business is all about. All you have to do is just take a portion of this section out of your strategy. If you just remove customers, you might have a fantastic project, product, a magnificent value proposition to which you all bow down and are excited about. You might have amazing strategies and systems and tactics. You might have the best team that are suitably qualified. You might have the most amazing management and team leaders. But if you take customers away, business becomes nothing. So we can come to a conclusion and say that 80% of our business is interpersonal relationships, interpersonal relationships with each other here 
in the team management and team members management and all the different departments so 80 percent is interpersonal skills and as an hr manager of an international banking company uh, where I served in the 32 English-speaking African countries, the Anglo-African countries, um, we realized that 80% of interpersonal skills is what business is all about. And 20% is the job description, which concludes and pays attention to skills, to talent, to knowledge, to education, and to experience. So when your team and you are hiring them because of that, and then of course also for their attitude, um, but if we, cannot, if we cannot pay attention to working with interpersonal relationships, both with our external customers and with our internal customers, no matter how good the product, no matter how good the value proposition, we are going to come short. I received a telephone call from the CEO from a, a company that was the service um, provider for coal mining in Middleburg and he called me in together with my partner at the time and said we've got about 10 mines in the area we've sent out our CRM system we were very privileged to have an average of 87.9 percent and they were over the moon and they opened up champagne bottles and three days after that out of the 10 contracts six emails popped up on the CEO screen saying when the contract that we presently have with you uh, ends we have an intention of not to continue the contract further with you so 60% is going down the drain they're saying goodbye the CEO calls us in and because we are neuroscience based he said please could you find out because we've got the best design CRM system we had it designed with a team of people overseas and it's a magnificent whatever whatever and even although our score was 83.7 percent 87.3 we get 60% of the people going, no thank you, with the next rollover of the contract. I wonder how flustered you would be if you had that news. You've got everything. You've got a, you've got a CRM system that pays attention to finding out stuff here about the customers. And you've got a leadership and management team that are ready to sell on, sell up, sell more, find more customers. But the question is, in finding more customers, what do we do with our present set of customers in terms of retention? So I'm paying attention to help us look at how we need to look at customers differently. So how does neuroscience look at the customer differently? So normal customer relationship management goes, let's pay attention to the socio, the psycho and the ego part of it. So there's like five types of psychological types. There's four types of sociotypes. There's ego that is there in the process. <coughs> and we want, we're going to measure their lifestyle, their hobbies, their interests and we're going to measure um, a little bit about our service level agreement that we're going to have with them and that is then based on the shallow reality of socio-psycho so we've got a brain that's our hardware the socio-psycho ego part of it is like having powerpoint word excel whatsapp uh, numbers they are the add-ons onto our neurology which is here within the brain now in our neurology is what we call our consciousness and in our consciousness are things like intentionality intelligence a huge amount of cognitive intelligence spatial intelligence 
we're already programmed with interconnectivity within our, new, uh, within our neurology. Our neurology already has intuition built into it. It has innovation built into it and it has connection and meaning. The instruments that are used to design CRM instruments do not pay attention to any of these and I've researched every single one. I've been in the business of coaching for just on three and a half decades. I've got 36,000 one-on-one -on -one hours with uh, working with CEOs and their Exco team so I I get the frontline reality of the strategy and what they're paying attention to. And so I come to a company and I find out, yes, we're doing marketing. And marketing nowadays is not just bringing awareness. So if your marketing team are only focused on our job is only awareness, you need to think of getting a new marketing team because the new style of marketing is not only paying attention to awareness, we don't want to know whether our product is out there and everybody can name our product. Um, marketing needs to pay attention to what does our product do for people? What is the problem that is solved? What is the issue that is solved? What is the, uh, the pizzazz, the, the, the fizz in the fizzy? So once marketing gains people, we then have prospects, we then turn a prospect into a sale, that person then buys, and there is a first level of values that uh, they buy with. So for instance, let me ask you, when you bought your car, what were the four things that were, were important to you when you bought your car? So when I think about my car that I bought, I think of, so what was important to me was the fact that it needs to be a family car. It needs to have economy. Uh, when the little red light on, I need to have a warranty and a service, so I need reliability. I looked at the model and the make, and I'm not ego driven by cars. So I didn't go for one of the big heavy models because I don't want to pay uh, three times the house's rent just for four wheels that's going to take me from point A to point B. I'm just not there uh, personally in my ego. Then um, the reality is I looked at economy, fuel economy, service economy. I'd ask questions like, so what is a replacement of a rear view mirror? And um, what is the replacement of whatever, whatever? And I'm not mechanically minded, but those are some of the questions that I asked to find out uh, beyond buying the car. So my first set of values, you also had a first set of values when you purchased your car. Now I'm asking you a question. After the sale, when you're taking your car and you're now taking it to servicing, so you service once or twice a year, you will notice there is a different set of values that switches on for the after sales service. So here I'm looking for cleanliness. I'm looking for expertise. I'm looking for please think ahead. I'm looking for add value for me. I'm looking for give me a clean car. Uh, I want you to um, fix small little things that I am not noticing and you can put that on the invoice and you can either charge for it or let me know. But there's a second set of values that CRM systems are not paying attention to, not one. So they create this questionnaire or they put it up on a call center for people to contact the customers or they use WhatsApp and we go, we need to stay in contact with our customers. But my question is, if you like any of the banks, ABSA Bank, Standard Bank, F&B Bank, um, First National Bank, I've been banking with them now for over two decades. I'm, I'm customer of all three. And the interesting part is that on my questionnaire that they send me once a year or whatever, or they let me know how was the service after every interaction with the call center, um, 
I'm still called dear valued customer. And I deeply resent that. Um, because they've featured me about 20 times and they've got my full names, they've got my address, they've got everything, but they still insist. Some IT director has decided we're going to be too lazy to type in a formula that says capture all the first names and surnames. They are on a system somewhere. Or they will say no, one system doesn't talk to another, but they the IT department that need to sort that out. And I'm still called dear valued customer. So it's just as good as I say to you, dear you. Dear valued you. How do you feel when I say that to you? So if your name is Amanda or your name is Tinnis or your name is Toomey and I say to you, dear you, and I send you an email, how would you feel after reading dear you? Well, it's just as equal to dear valued customer. It's a generalization. You've turned your customer into a nominalization. You've turned them into a average and you've turned them and you have devalued them in terms of who they are in terms of their self-identity. When we look at the design of working with customer relationship management systems and questionnaires, some have dared to say um, we're using, we, we're thinking of using AI and we're going, wow, now everybody is on AI and everybody is using technical, just like education. They're going, oh, it's like we, we're now moving online and it's all exciting because now everybody's using computers and etc. etc. And I'm going, but you're still teaching the same brain. So the brain comes to work. The personality and the socio and the ego come to work as well, but the neurology comes to work. And we're failing to do that. So let's look at the, and I've researched what are some of the moans and groans of people around um, customer relationship management systems. And here's what they say. Well, they cannot guarantee great questions because they're poorly designed. The reason why they're poorly designed is because it creates what is called as brain fog or brain disconnect, every single one of them. The questions are all biased. So it's what the marketing team want to hear versus what everybody else wants to hear or wish they'd love to hear. The responses are normally very, very low. And we, in marketing, they'll say, no, if you get a 2% return, then that's amazing. And I'm going, that's interesting. So the validity and the reliability of the questionnaire over time goes down. Uh, and this has got to do, and you can measure this with psychometrics. The questionnaire is limited, limited to a scope because you can't give a 45 page questionnaire. That's why we've come up with what is known as uh, rapid research. And we maintain contact with customers uh, um, every 20 days with three short questions and at the end uh, of a particular quarter we bring those questions together and we create a profile based on neuroscience markers. There's a limited scope. The questions tend to generalize. The timing of the questionnaire as to when it goes out is also debatable and the, you also get poor response and low response because of the wrong timing. There's inaccurate data analysis and that happens very quickly. They have insufficient data, so you've got data that you don't need. You've got lots of data but you can't turn it into intelligence. So 46% of our people play golf, 27 like the movies, 36% like uh, theater and I'm going and and your product is and they're going well our product is unless you diners club or standard master or any mastercard uh, then you'll be interested in lifestyle stuff 
and then you know what to advertise to people. Um, the whole thing of creating a questionnaire with language, in neuroscience we say words are only rumors. So every word needs to be unpacked with meaning so that we can understand. When you say to a person, how are you feeling today? And the person says, no, I'm feeling a bit peeved off. How is peeved off different to I'm livid? And you hear two different intensities in the word. But when the person describes peeved off, it could be similar to livid, but just less intensity. So we do need to find out because the neurology uses language with meaning. And then here's the big, big thing about customer relationship management is there's a lack of follow up. They only follow up when they want to sell a new product and let you know. But in the meantime, here we have a customer who's busy transforming and changing and growing and developing in their world. And we're not keeping abreast of the internal shifts where we find customers going. There's also inadequate feedback. There's poorly trained staff that create disconnect. You try calling a call um, center by opening up a system and you're going, I have paid my account. And the person will say, well, the system says you haven't. So because the system says I haven't, therefore the call center person now treats me to doubt in the fact that I've actually got the document here in front of me and the statement to prove it, that it's gone into the bank. But something in the system on the other side is lacking. So you have this disconnect and therefore you have poorly trained staff who, who are only empowered to ask questions around the system in a very mechanical and logical and methodical way and they miss the people reality and therefore they get a huge amount of tension from people. Companies have insufficient resources to maintain the customer relationship management system. They, there's no sell on approach to the CRM system. They're they, they only telling you about the latest product or they're telling you about the new insurance policy, etc. And you kind of feel the only time you're contacting me is when you tell me about something new that you're expecting me to buy. There's a lack of personalization and that brings me to the dear you and my name is critical to me. It's part of my identity. And it is a neurological marker. My personal identity is one of the key neurological markers that if you don't build that in to your customer relationship system, uh, it's might as well calling them everybody dear you and going, well, that's who they are. What's your name again? Oh, we don't want to bother. I've got it, but I forgot it. But I'm going to call you dear you or dear valued customer. Other thing that impacts customer relationship management is customer fatigue. They are much, they get tired of receiving yet another question or another questionnaire and it pops up after you've had a call center uh, encounter or a bank encounter uh, or an encounter with a salesperson. It says, please don't you mind just rating our, uh, our customer uh, service and the biased questions that they ask is, um, is this person uh, average, good, very good? There's a bias in it. So there's no space for poor. Um, so there's a lack of customization. I'd like to ask you a question at this stage. After hearing what you've heard now about customer relationship management system, my question is this. Out of 10, how much do you trust the customer relationship management system. Trust its validity and trust its reliability over time. And just pop the score in into the chat box and Tony will kind of just give me an average of what what you folks are saying about that. So what are relationship management systems missing? The connection index or the kaleidoscope, as we call it, that we've designed, where we went to these 
mining companies and we sat down with the people and we created a conversation with them and we could accurately come back to the CEO and go we can now tell you um, the people are right they are going to leave but they they leaving because of reasons that you've never asked you didn't even know these reasons but we unearthed them in a one-to-one -one conversation in a face-to-face heart-to-heart mind-to-mind conversation and people can be trained to do that your sales team can be trained to do that your after-service team can be tr trained to do that you can have your call center team trained to be able to create a person-to-person -person encounter the big thing about AI is that they say AI is going to be as intelligent as, as, hum, as human people. As a neurologist, I question that. So AI, and I use AI in the development of writing articles and blogs and things like that, and I have to correct a lot of things because AI doesn't have an interpersonal connection with people. It has a logical chronological association relationship with people so that it's a cognitive but it's not an interconnected interpersonal uh, intrapersonal uh, uh, driven relationship so the neuromarkers over here in what we've designed in terms of our connection index is we cover the thing which is called consciousness so consciousness is what's happening now you're hearing my vocabulary you're hearing my argument you're hearing my empathy you're hearing my passion you're hearing my expertise and if i had to send you a document rather than being uh, on this synapsis which is different to a seminar you would have a different impact if I sent it to you via a document why because the brain has eight brain languages with which it collates information into an experience sending a questionnaire you're only paying attention to one of the eight which is auditory and when you read a word you're reading auditory so this page is very auditory orientated it's visible but it's not visual so it's not a diagram maybe a little getaway with a arrow over there and the flow downward and the lines that are connecting that'll make it visual but it's mostly auditory orientated so this style of presentation has cut out six of the eight brain languages so the people who are prone to create experiences with the other languages other than auditory feel lost in this presentation they're going to be leaning forward because they want to see so that's visual so we work on consciousness because that's the connectivity between people a conscious connection it's all the i words when we look at what is the neuroscience and there we looked at the the neuroscience of words and we need to go back to that and the neuroscience of words that we paid attention to was words like uh, intuition um, incisiveness interconnectedness um, intentionality intelligence all of those i words are part of what we call our consciousness which is the aliveness which is within the brain the brain is the hardware the neuroscience this part is the DOS program your brain has got 13 brain intelligences have you considered that you're talking to an intelligent person that has 11 intelligences so they only go for the cognitive and they only ask questions that are cognitive but they don't ask questions that are emotive and even when you ask questions that are emotive uh, people find difficulty in answering that question because it is written in such a way that when the brain reads it 
and the neurology reads it, it doesn't go into the feeling mode. The brain has got sorting style. It's got 28 sorting styles. The brain and the neurology has got 20, uh, 10 to 20 cognitive biases. A cognitive bias is a lazy way of thinking. So when you open up the questionnaire, your first thing is, let me get over with this and let me just go and get a feel of, okay, it's 0 to 5. So if I give a 3 or a 4, um, I'm, I'm going to be okay with this. And then they start guessing. And that's all cognitive bias that comes into play there. And then there are seven levels of thinking. Now, all of these are neuromarkers that are also part of our logical levels. So we've got seven logical levels uh, in the brain as well, in the mind. So every thought, every feeling, which is backed up with an emotion and an energy that goes with that emotion, turns into an action and that turns into personality and sociology and ego. But our set of beliefs, so when people say you've got a belief system, it's hidden in here. So the belief system is a compilation of a whole lot of things in here. My values as a person, the five reasons why I purchased my car, the values, the things that are important to me that are non-negotiable, that create anger, the emotion called anger within me when they are overstepped either by myself or others, that's also woven into these neuromarkers. My self-identity, which is my name, and I honor my name, and I respect my name, and it's also very strongly linked to self-importance. So when a person says to me, dear valued customer, they are ignoring my self-identity and my self importance and they devalue me and immediately there's agitation uh, in my neurology so I'm going you know what you really don't I told the bank when we went through COVID you're treating me like a number you gave me a wonderful loan I think it was 3,200 Rand which I had to pay off very quickly but uh, you thought that 3,200 Rand was going to really help me get out of the mess. It didn't. I had to sell my car so that we could live on and get through COVID so that we can continue beyond COVID in terms of the impact that that had um, on our, one of our businesses. Then there's a level of meaning and the level of meaning is very deep within my level of logic and then there is interconnectedness which when you add all these neuromarkers up add up to understanding all of that. So in the design of our neuro uh, kaleidoscope uh, profile of neuro connection we used all these markers instead of personality and you do that basically in a conversational style and we can come along and we can help you as a company uh, and your team to understand and we can design a company specific person to person jam packed 94 percent accurate uh, questionnaire that will give you information be one beyond what you can imagine. One of the questions is now that you've purchased the product from us what three things do we need to do to mess up our relationship so that your exit lights will switch on and it's an open-ended question. CRM systems hate open-ended questions. Marketing teams hate open-ended questions but the open-endedness is where the reality lies. It's where the meaning lies. So AI says well we're going to put in uh, we're going to watch behavior, we're going to look at eye focusing, and we're going to put in a, a little machine that reads emotion, but that still can't give you intelligence. So, yay, the person is happy. But how long is that happy going to, how long is that happy going to stay? So the neuro are all those I words that we shared later on and it creates connection. So word is only a rumor. So we have to unpack the meaning in context. We designed a very powerful question process, which is interconnected face to face, heart to heart, 
mind-to-mind -mind connection, which includes meaning, personal motivation that's based on meaning, plus values, plus belief systems, plus self-identity. We included personalizing it very strongly, and we had a Nero feedback me mechanism that is built into it uh, that keeps us accurately connected with people. So what does the neuroscience approach do differently? It reduces bias, it creates consciousness connection, it activates the mirror neuron, so we have a connection. It's like watching a movie or a rugby game or a basketball game. Your mirror neuron switches on and you feel as if you're on the field and that's why you shout at the ref. It's in real time. A part in the brain called your insula switches on, which pays attention to the emotional connection. You have a synchronization of brain waves, which you never get in a questionnaire. And that's critical because that you say, we click and that you'll never find in a CRM system. And then it goes beyond rapport that people call we must build rapport with our customers. The amygdala, which you are two of them, one in each hemisphere, processes our emotional world. The hippocampus, there's also two of them, which processes our social interaction and our prefrontal cortex uh, focuses on social cognition. So when we worked with our questionnaire and our interview, so it's a person-to-person -person interconnected interview, we paid attention and we aligned the product uh, to why the person bought. So we said, tell me why you bought the product. Then we paid attention to asking questions. So tell me what were the values that you noticed that helped you to buy the product? Give me some responsiveness in terms of what happens when things go great, what happens when the service delivery goes wrong. Uh, what would cause your exit light to switch on? That's never asked in a CRM system. They'll ask it in another way. Um, give us some other ideas of things that we could change. But that's a bias built into it. They're too damn scared to ask cognitive conscious reality questions where on face to face you can ask those questions with people and they will give you the feedback. The relationship um, is based on good versus please tell me when will your exit lights go on in our ongoing relationship uh, when you will say I no longer. So my exit lights have been on with all my banks uh, for just on the past 15 years. Why haven't I left? Well, I haven't found a bank um, that can serve me, but I'm just got to be happy with what I've got. And uh, so I'm now deciding in this year that I'm going to cut off two banks and, and choose one. But um, yeah, to make that choice is very interesting. The question there in the index is paid attention to in real time the momentum of their mind, the pacing of how things must happen and where, and the deepest connection. And it's built on a face-to-face, heart-to-heart relationship. So we have a quality of relationship. CRM systems manage the information of the relationship. They do not manage the quality of connection. You only can do that with people. You can only do that with a people interaction and with a face-to-face -face interaction.